Chapter Four, Part J of Greener Than You Think. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Greener Than You Think by Ward Moore. Chapter Four, Part J. In spite of Miss Frances's blindness to her own interest, I still had a prospective superintendent for the gathering and shipping of the grass, George. Thario. Unless his obsession had sent him down into Mississippi or Louisiana, I expected to find him in Indianapolis. The short journey west was tedious and uncomfortable, repeating the pattern of the one southward. At the end of it there was no garrulous chief dispatcher, for the airport was completely deserted, and I was thankful for an ample stock of gas for the return flight. I had no difficulty locating Joe in an immense, high-ceilinged, furnished room, in one of the ugliest, gray, weather-boarded houses of which the city, never celebrated for its architecture, could boast. The first thing to impress me was the room's warmth. For the first time since landing I did not shiver. A wood fire burned in an open grate, and a kerosene heater smelled obstinately in an opposite corner. A grand piano stood in front of the long, narrow windows, and on it slouched several thick piles of curly-edged paper. He greeted me with something resembling affection. The tycoon himself! Workers of the world, resume your chains. A.W., it's a pleasure to see you, and looking so smooth and ordinary and unharassed, too, at the moment everyone else is tearing himself with panic or anguish. How do you do it? I look on the bright side of things, Joe, I answered. Worry never helped anybody accomplish anything, and it takes fewer muscles to smile than to frown. You hear that, Florence? I had not noticed her when I came in, the original of the snapshot, sitting placidly in a corner darning socks. I must say the photograph had done her less than justice, for though she was undoubtedly common-looking and sloppy, with heavy breasts and coarse red cheeks and unconcealedly dyed hair, there was yet about her an air of great vitality, kindness, and good nature. Parenthetically, she acknowledged my presence with a pleasant smile. You hear that? Remind me the next time I am troubled by a transposition or a solo passage that it takes less muscles to smile than to frown for I have got to work at last, A.W. The loafing and inviting of my soul is past. My soul has responded to my invitation. You remember Chrysod's Devilgrass Symphony? A horrible misconception, if ever there was one. A personal insult to anyone who ever saw the grass. A dull, unintentional joke. Bad Schoenberg, if that isn't a tautology combined with faint memories of the most vulgar Wagner, if that isn't another tautology, threaded together on Mighty Like a Rose and Alexander's Ragtime Band. But what am I saying, A.W., to you who are so free from the virus of culture? What the hell interest of you in Chris Hudd's symphony, or my symphony, or anybody's symphony, except the polyphony of prophets? I hope no one thinks I'm a narrow-minded man, Joe, I reproved him. I venture to say I have as much interest in art as the next person. I've done a bit of writing myself, you know, and literature. Oh, sure. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. You did not. But while I believe music is a fine thing in its place, I came to discuss a different subject. If you mean taking Joe back to Europe with you, you're out of luck, Mr. Weiner, put in Florence placidly. He's almost finished the first movement, and will never leave the grass till it's all done. You mistake me, Mrs. Thario. I have a proposition for your husband, but far from taking him away from the grass, it will bring him closer to it. Impossible! exclaimed Joe. I am the grass, and the grass is me. In mystical union we have become a single entity. I speak with its voice, and in the great cadences which come from its heart, you can hear Thario's first, transfigured and magnified a hundred thousand times. I was sorry to note his speech, always so simple and unaffected in contrast to his letters, was infected with an unbecoming pomposity. Looking at him closely, I saw he had lost weight 
His flesh had shrunk closer to his big frame, and the lines of his skull stood out sharply in his cheek and jaw. There was the faintest touch of gray in his hair, and his fingers played nervously with the ragged and ill-advised beard on his chin. He hardly looked the man who had evaded serious work in order to encourage a silly obsession, comfortably supported all the while by a sizable remittance from his father. I outlined to them my plans for gathering samples of the weed. Florence tucked her still-threaded needle between her teeth and inspected the current pair of socks critically. Joe walked over to the piano and struck several discordant notes. "'I understand there are several parties making expeditions onto the grass,' I said. "'Lots,' confirmed Joe. "'There's a group sent out by Brother Paul on some very mysterious mission. It's called the Sanctification of the Forerunner. God knows how many thousands he's made his suckers cough up, for they're equipped with all the latest gadgets for polar exploration, skis and dog sleds, moon pitcher cameras, radios, and unheard of quantities of your very best pemmican. They started as soon as the snow was thick enough to bear their weight, and if we have an untimely thaw, they'll go to join the Russians. Then there's the government bunch, the Disruptions Commission having finally and reluctantly produced an idea, but exactly what it is they haven't confided to an eager citizenry. Smaller groups, too. Scientists and near-scientists. Enthusiasts who have got the notion somehow that animals or migratory game are roaming the snow on top of the grass. Exactly how they got there is not explained. Planning to photograph, hunt, or trap and just plain folk making the trip for the hell of it. We might have gone ourselves if it hadn't been for the symphony. Your symphony is concerned with the grass? I asked politely. It's concerned with combinations of sound. He looked at me sharply and banged out harsher discords. With life, if you want to talk like a program note. If you go on this expedition, it will give you an opportunity to gather new material, I pointed out. If I look out the window, or consult my navel, or meditate while at stool, or cut my finger, I will get new material with much less hardship. The last thing a composer or writer or painter needs is material. It is from excess of material he is the besotted creature he is. He may lack leisure, or energy, or ability, or an act of colon, but no masterpiece ever was or conceivably could be thwarted from lack of material. Yet you have tied yourself to the grass. Not to prostitute it to whatever talents I have, but because it is the most magnificent thing on earth. Then of course you'll go, I said. Why don't you go yourself, eh, W? Do you good to live out in the open. I can't afford the time, Joe. I have too many things that need my personal attention. He struck a series of great thumping notes. And so have I, A.W., eh, so have I. I'm afraid you'll have to get somebody else. I could neither understand nor shake his obstinacy, and when I left them I had almost determined to abandon the whole project, for I could not think whom else trustworthy I could get. His idea of my own participation was fantastic. I had long since come to the point where it was necessary to delegate all such duties to subordinates. Perhaps it was Joe's sly remark about it doing me good to be out in the open, or the difficulty of getting a conveyance, but I decided to walk to my hotel. Taxis, of course, disappeared with gasoline, but ingenious men, unwilling to be pauperized by accepting the dole, had devised rickshaws and bicycle carriages, which were the only means of local transportation. The night was clear and cold, the stars gleaming in distant purity, but all around the offensive smell of the disheveled city played on my disgusted nostrils. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Brother? are you saved when the figure had come out from the shadow of a building to accost me my first thought had been of a hold-up but the odd salutation made this seem unlikely what do you want i asked brother are you a christian man i resented the impertinence and started to walk on he followed close beside me harden not your heart miserable sinner but let jesus dissolve your pride as he washes away your other sins 
be not high and mighty for the high shall be low and the mighty powerless in a short time you will be food for grass the grass is food for the ox the divine ox with seven horns which shall come upon the world with a great trumpeting and bellowing soon after the forerunner i knew of the great multiplication of insanity and hoped i could reach the hotel before he grew violent what is your name i temporized call me brother paul for i was once saul the worldly now i am your brother in christ brother paul the radio preacher we are all members one of another and he who watches the sparrow fall makes no distinction between one man-made label and another all of us who have found christ jesus with the help of brother paul are called brother paul come to the loving arms o miserable sinner and be brother paul also i thought it might be very confusing i have always been interested in religion o oh, puny man interested in life and interested in death interested in being and interested in begetting interested in religion and interested in dung turn from those interests which the devil pays upon your soul's mortgage your savior resides in the heart of the grass withhold not your precious soul from him at this very moment the forerunner is being sanctified and after her there will come the ox to eat the grass and then the end of the world give brother paul your worthless earthly possessions give your soul to jesus and hasten that glorious day hallelujah the fervid jumble ended in a near scream what a waste of oratorical and perhaps organizational energy i mused as i strode along rapidly still intent on escaping the fanatic under different circumstances i thought a man like this might turn out to be a capable clerk or minor executive suddenly i had a hunch mr brother paul i have no earthly name i wish you'd come with me for a few minutes i have a proposition which might interest you in the darkness i could see him peering at me suspiciously is this some worldly seduction from the christian path i think you will find what i have to offer a material aid to your church i have no church he said we are christians and recognize no man-made institution well then to your movement or whatever you call it in spite of his reluctance which was now as great as mine had been originally i persuaded him to accompany me he sat uneasily forward while i told him who i was and sketched the plan for collecting some of the grass what is this to me i have long ago put aside all material thoughts and now care only for the life of the spirit this must be true i thought noting his shabby clothes sweat greasy muffler at once hiding and revealing lack of necktie and cracked shoes one sock brown the other black it is this to you if you don't want the salary and bonus attached to organizing and superintending the expedition and i am prepared to be generous you can turn it over to brother paul i imagine it will be acceptable he shook his head muttering satan satan the lower part of his face was wide and divided horizontally like an inverted jelly mold it tapered up into bracketing ears supporting gingery eaves i pressed home my arguments i will put your proposition to brother paul he conceded at length i thought distinctions between one man and another were worldly and trivial i prodded him aren't you brother paul satan satan he repeated i'm sure it could have been nothing but one of those flashes of intuition for which successful executives are noted which caused me to pick this man in spite of his absurd ranting and ill-favored appearance not intuition really but an ability to evaluate and classify personalities instantly i had always had this faculty it helped me in my early experiences as a salesman and blossomed out when i entered my proper field anthony prebblesham for that was his worldly name did not disappoint my judgment for he proved one of the most aggressive men i ever hired the brother paul hocus-pocus which he quickly dropped 
had merely caught and canalized an abounding energy which would otherwise have flowed aimlessly in a stagnant world. In consolidated pemmican he found his true faith. His zeal for our products proved as great, if not greater, than his former hysteria for the salvation of mankind. It was no fault of his that the expedition he led proved fruitless. The men Tony Prebleson took with him were all Brother Paul's, who, since they disdained them, had not been told of material rewards, but given the impression they were furthering their fanatical creed. They built a camp upon the grass, or rather upon the snow which overlay the grass, near what had once been Springfield, Illinois. Digging down through the snow to the weed, they discovered it to have lost most of its rubbery qualities of resistance in dormancy, and cut with comparative ease more than four tons, which were transported with the greatest difficulty to the Florida plant. Here, to anticipate, their work came to nothing, for no practicable method was found for reducing the grass to a form in which its nutritive elements could be economically extracted. The secrecy surrounding the government expedition could not be maintained, and it was soon learned that what was planned was nothing less than an attempt to burn great areas of the weed while in its dormant state. All previous attempts to fire the grass had been made when the sap was running, and it was thought that in its drier condition some measure of success might be obtained. The public instantly translated possibility into probability, and probability into virtual certainty, their enthusiastic optimism making the winter more bearable. The party proceeded not more than a couple of miles beyond the eastern edge, dragging with them a flexible pipeline through which was pumped fuel oil, now priceless in the freezing cities. Methodically they sprayed a square mile and set it afire, feeding the flames with the oil. The burning area sank neatly through the snow, exposing the grass beneath, dry, yellow, and brittle. The stiff, interwoven stolons caught, oil was applied unstintedly, the cracking and roaring and snapping could be heard by those well beyond the perimeter of the grass, and the terrific heat forced the temporary abandonment of the work. The spot broadcasters, in emotional voices, gave the news to those whose radios still functioned. Reporters flashed their editors, "'Burning successful! We'll stop grass if multiplied!' All over the country volunteer crews were instantly formed to repeat the experiment. When the flames died down, the men crept closer to inspect the result. The heat had melted the snow for many yards outside the orbit of fire, revealing a border of dull and sodden grass. Beyond this border, a blackened crater had eaten its way straight down to the reclaimed earth below. Shouting and rejoicing greeted this evidence of triumph. What if the grass could advance at will in summer? It could be subdued in winter, and thus kept in check till the ingenuity which devised this one victory could win another. Working furiously, the oil was again sprayed, this time over a still larger piece, and again the flames lit the sky. The President issued a proclamation of thanksgiving. The American dollar rose by one hundred and seventy-five dollars to the pound, and several prominent expatriates began to think seriously of returning home. The second fire burned through the night, and aided by a slight change in the weather, thawed the snow over a great area. Eagerly the expedition, now swollen into a small army, returned to continue their triumphant labors. The bright sun shone upon the dirtied snow, upon naked muddy earth in the center of the crater, upon the network of burnt and blackened stems, and upon the wide band of grayish-green grass the retreating snow had laid open to its rays. Grayish-green, but changing in color at every moment as the work of spraying began again. Changing color, becoming more verdant, thrusting blades into the air moving its long runners upward and sideways and downward into the destroyed part. Revived by the heat, relieved of the snow, the grass, fighting for its life with the same intensity which animated its attackers, burst into a fury of growth. It covered the evidences of destruction in less time than the burning had taken. It tore the pipeline from its tormentor's hands and drove them away with threats of swift immolation. Defiantly, it rose to a pinnacle, hiding its mutilation, and flaunted its vivid tendrils to bear witness to its invulnerability, till a killing frost followed by another snowfall covered it again. Since the delusive hope had been so high, 
the disappointment threw the public into a despair greater than ever before the nervous tension of anxiety was replaced by a listlessness of resignation and the suicide rate high before now doubled for the first time a general admission was to be heard that no solution would be found and in another season the end would come for the united states facing the prospect squarely an exodus of the little people as distinguished from the earlier flight of men of wealth and foresight from the country began this was the first countermeasure attempted since the grass crossed the mississippi and in reaction to its collapse the return of brother paul's expedition passed almost unnoticed only time now published in paris bothered to report it for general circulation last week from some undisclosed spot in mid u s returned mother the forerunner joan real name unknown and party dispatched grassward by brother paul doom predicting advent prophesying graminophile evangelist the purpose of mother jones expedition had been her sanctification above the exact spot where the saviour was waiting in the midst of the grass to receive his faithful disciples said brother paul to reporters after embracing the forerunner enthusiastically the expedition has been successful said mother joan off the record my feet hurt. End of chapter 4, part J.